Have you ever taken a personality test before? Maybe one like this? Or maybe you've taken far more important personality tests, like which Harry Potter house you belong to. But what if there is a criminal personality? Would you want to take that test? In this video, we're diving into one of the most fascinating theories on criminal behaviour by legendary psychologist Hans Eysenck. Could your personality determine whether you're at risk of criminal behaviour? Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. During World War II, Hans Eysenck worked as a psychologist in military hospitals in England and from his observations of the different soldiers he treated he suggested two core dimensions of personality. In his book Dimensions of Personality in 1947 he called these extroversion versus introversion and neuroticism versus stability. Later on in his research Eysenck added a third dimension which he called psychoticism combining together into his three factors model, sometimes referred to as P-E-N. Importantly for Isaac, these personality traits aren't just random, they come from your biology. Let's explore each of these parts of the personality and how they relate to criminal behaviour before discussing Isaac's research and the ways his theory has been criticised. And I'll also show you where you can take a test to see if you have the criminal personality. First up, extroversion and introversion. This is the one that you've probably heard about before, and it's important to note that each of these dimensions are on a continuum. In other words, we are all somewhere along this line, rather than just being an extrovert or an introvert. Extroversion refers to people who are more outgoing, enjoy social interactions, prefer the company of others, and seek excitement and stimulation. In contrast, introversion refers to people who are more reserved and thoughtful. They tend to be quieter, more reflective, and prefer solitary activities or smaller social gatherings. But where does this come from? According to Isaac, extroversion and introversion are affected by the level of cortical arousal. Let me explain. In your brain is the brain stem, and in the brain stem is something called the RAS, Reticular Activating System. This is where the spinal cord meets the brain. Our nervous system receives information from the environment and sends this to the brain. The RAS in the brain stem is thought to act as a filter that controls how much stimulation or activation the brain receives. For people who are more introverted, Isaac suggests that their RAS lets more information through to the brain. It doesn't filter it as much, which means that their normal state is to be more stimulated. They have a higher level of cortical arousal, of arousal in the brain. Because their brains are already highly stimulated, they are more sensitive to extra stimuli and can easily become overstimulated. Introverts tend to prefer quieter surroundings and being alone because their nervous system is more easily overwhelmed by stimulating situations. So now meet Eric. Eric is an extrovert. Isaac's theory suggested that the RAS in extroverts filters out more information than normal, which means they are less stimulated. In other words, they have a lower level of cortical arousal. This means that for individuals high in extroversion, typical activities may not provide enough stimulation. As a result, people like Eric may be drawn to criminal acts that offer an adrenaline rush, or a sense of danger. They are trying to compensate for their lower natural levels of arousal by engaging in activities that increase stimulation. I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. You know, I just do things. Now, Isaac wasn't entirely focused on biology as he included environmental influences too. Isaac's model explains how arousal levels influence the ability to learn from social conditioning. Conditioning in this context refers to how we learn what is good behaviour and what is bad behaviour. All being well, we should associate socially acceptable behaviours with rewards and criminal behaviour with punishments. But what if this doesn't work so well in some people? Well, Isaac suggests that extroverts like Eric 
are less easily conditioned because of their lower arousal. They do not learn as easily from punishments or rewards because their under aroused nervous system makes them less responsive to external feedback. For example, if as a child Eric did an unacceptable behaviour like steal another child's toy and then Eric was punished for it by being shouted at or being grounded, Heisen would suggest that Eric wouldn't learn from this as well as others because his nervous system is not stimulated enough by this punishment. It's too weak. This might explain why they are more likely to engage in rule breaking, antisocial behaviour despite experiencing negative consequences, as punishment does not have a strong enough impact on them. The next dimension is neuroticism versus stability. Neuroticism, according to Isaac, refers to an individual's emotional instability. People high in neuroticism are more likely to react strongly to stress. In contrast, the trait of stability relates to those who are more emotionally stable. They are able to remain calm and balanced and composed even in stressful or challenging situations. So meet Neil. Neil is high in neuroticism, which means he's more prone to anxiety, fear, anger and emotional reactivity. In a criminal context, Neil may act out aggressively when faced with stressful situations. His heightened emotional responses might lead him to overreact. What do you mean everyone? But why is that? Well, according to Isaac, it's back to biology. This emotional reactivity is thought to be connected to an overactive limbic system in the brain. The limbic system is located deep within the brain, beneath the cerebral cortex. It involves areas such as the amygdala and hypothalamus, which regulate emotional responses like fear and aggression. In a criminal context, this emotional instability can make someone like Neil lash out and commit crimes, stealing, assaulting or worse, with very little planning or forethought. The last part of Isaac's three-part model is psychoticism. So meet Phil. Phil scores highly in psychoticism. Psychoticism is the tendency to be antisocial, cold, and less empathetic. According to Isaac, people like Phil, who score high in this trait, are the ones most likely to engage in serious criminal behaviour. Why? Because they simply don't care about social norms or how their actions affect others. This makes them much more likely to commit violent crimes without any guilt or remorse, whether it's theft, assault, or even something more extreme. You remind me of my father. I hate my father. The criminal personality is not just someone highly extroverted, like Eric, not someone highly neurotic, like Neil, or even someone high in psychoticism, like Phil. In fact, it's a different person altogether. For Isaac, the criminal personality is high in all three dimensions. It's like Eric, Neil and Phil all rolled into one character. There are many film characters who exemplify these traits or who come very close. The next time you're watching a film, I challenge you to be on the lookout for characters that have these three traits. Here's one as an example. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me know in the comments below if you know of any more examples. If you'd like to find out how you score on each of these dimensions, check out the link in the description below where you can take a questionnaire. And if you do score rather highly, don't worry, because we're about to critically evaluate Isaac's theory to see if it's any good. So what would supporting evidence look like for Isaac's criminal personality? It would be finding that real criminals score more highly in the traits of psychoticism, extroversion and neuroticism when compared with non-criminals. In other words, there is a relationship between personality and criminal behaviour. And you guessed it, that's exactly what Isaac did. In fact, he carried out this research with his wife. Sybil Isaac in 1977. How romantic. Further support for Isaac's criminality comes from more recent research into the brains of criminals. You may remember from the previous video on genetic and neural explanations that Ray Natal in 1997 conducted research with murderers who pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. And they found when comparing brain scans of murderers with a non-criminal control group that they had a less active prefrontal cortex. 
and this can lead to less self-control, particularly in relation to your emotions, which fits very well with what Isaac described with neuroticism. However, some researchers questioned Isaac's ideas. One study examined Hispanic American male prisoners in a New York maximum security prison, which provided a culturally distinct sample compared to the broader, more general samples Isaac used in his research. They used a similar methodology to that of Isaac, using personality tests to measure the same key dimensions. They compared the results from these male prisoners in the maximum security prison with a non-criminal control group and they found that Hispanic American inmates scored lower on extroversion compared to the general population. The study's results suggested that these offenders were less outgoing and thrill-seeking than what Isaac's theory would predict. Therefore, this undermines Isaac's theory because it might not account for cultural differences in personality traits among different groups of criminals. Furthermore, Isaac's theory of the criminal personality can be criticised for being deterministic. We've seen this a number of times in the forensics topic, and in the case of Isaac, this is because one of the main factors behind the criminal personality is biology. And one of the problems with arguing that biology is the cause is that it can lead people to blame their biology for their behaviour. In this case, if someone committed a crime, they could argue it's not their fault. It's not their responsibility because they can't do anything about their nervous system. And yes, while sometimes in extreme cases, mitigating circumstances are taken into account, the judge still says you are responsible for your actions and so you will bear the consequences. In other words, a purely determined deterministic view is at odds with the justice system and society's understanding of responsibility and free will. So what do you think? Does Isaac's theory make sense? Could personality really be the key to understanding criminal behaviour? Let me know in the comments if you think this explains the mind of a criminal, or if you believe it's all about how you are raised. In fact, in the next video we're going to explore that very idea with a theory by this happy looking bloke who proposed that criminal behaviour can be explained through analysing the people we hang around with. To watch that video, you can click on the screen now or on the video linked in the description below. And for more resources relating to psychology, check out the Bear It In Mind website. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one. Oh. Ah.